last time. So what we can do now is recording. Um, we can basically then just um, put the recording up on YouTube. It will be saved on Facebook um, as per last time. Hi, Nikki. Hi, uh, Samantha. And hello, everyone else watching. So there's like 10, 12 people, I think, my phone saying now. Uh, Dorian, long time no see. Right, so let's get moving on with things. Um, so had again people ask me about metatarse algae um, and we'll come on to why I, that I really really dislike um, of that term uh, metatarse algae it's, it's something that I think it's the long it should be put in a bin with shin splints and over pronation in, in in my opinion but hey ho so as like last time I got some good feedback from people about they like the PowerPoint style of stuff um, so let's share my screen and let's get uh, cracking on. Da, da, da. Did I not? Why isn't it? There we go. So let's play from the beginning. There we go. So you should all now be seeing um my the powerpoint slide ready to get going so firstly um credit to um catherine ashton um for that wonderful image that is a hand-drawn image um that um i basically had a jpeg uh, made up of that um and that was for one of our staff members dr charlotte dando as part of her her PhD in Morton's in Rome, um, she drew this wonderful image and yeah, it's just, I think it's pretty cool. I, I like stuff like that. So metatarse algae, um, what is it? Um, in a nutshell, it's a description for pain in the ball of the foot and that is it. It is not a diagnosis. Um, and so technically it's not a diagnosis you can't you can't treat it it's like if we remember from last week speaking about um, shin splints if, if you're saying you've got shin splints that doesn't tell us healthcare professionals what is actually going on all it tells is you've got pain in the shin all metatarse algae is is just a posh word for saying you've got pain in the ball of the foot but because it's got some nice amounts of numbers of letters and it's a nice, it's a nice long word it sounds pretty cool. It sounds really medical. It sounds um, kind of funky, but it from a from a medical viewpoint, all it just says is just pain in the ball of it. It doesn't tell you why. And obviously, when you've got pain in the ball of it, you want to know what it is because if you don't know what it is, um, when you then go and then see your local healthcare professional, um, you, you need to know what it is, so then we can then formulate a treatment plan. Um, so again, it's like there's a term that we really need to stop using in, in my opinion. And it's just, again, just highlights that it's all about getting the right um, uh, a diagnosis. Um, so what are the possible causes? So obviously these, all these talks are really aimed at, at, at patients. So what I want to try and do with these is just trying to keep them nice and simple and not for people with medical terms. And essentially, when the, these were just a list of things that I think could be related, what is called metatarse algae, what, what people think. And as you can sort of see, this is why I don't like the term, because this is just a very, very small number of things that I think could cause um, <clears throat> pain in the ball of your foot. And obviously, how you're going to manage a foreign body is completely different to someone if you've got osteoarthritis or a neuroma um, and yeah I, I foreign bodies in the ball of the foot I seen people go on honeymoons and stand on sea urchins and then you leave a bit of a spike in there that we've had to get surgically removed so I had someone who had something called um, peripheral neuropathy which means that they've got no feeling in the foot at all um, there we go neuropathy I haven't put neuropathy on there I've, I've missed that one out as well um, and they stood on a, a scalpel blade that they used to use to undo some of their um, sewing work and they didn't realise and this, this blade got embedded in the foot and they had no idea um, it was there. <clears throat> so if we then sort of think about 
for us at NK Active, the most common causes of um, um, pain in the ball of the foot. For us, it's going to be neuromas. Um, we, we've also developed, not by, we have by mistake also, just a sort of a passion and a reputation for treating plant plate injuries. And if anyone wants to read some more stuff about it, if you head to Tom Goom's Running Repair um, website, you'll see a series of blogs that I've written on them about um, plant to plate injuries. And we just literally put up this week a new one about how can you treat these without having surgery? Uh, because I think it can be treated really well, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, bunions. And also then with bunions, an interesting one. So a bunion is where we're going to get, I'll show you later, if we look at the model of the foot, is a deviation of the metatarsal on the toe bone and is basically deviating in towards the midline of, of the foot. And what's interesting about bunions, for example, is that the bunion itself may not be painful, but it then may be then resulting in causing, um, yeah, it's there, it was um, um, a Tom Goon. What I will do after I finish this, I'll put the links for everything um, in, in the comments for people to go then have a look at those things. So going back to the bunion, the bunion itself may not be painful, but then actually the repercussions of what the bunion can then cause, maybe. And then tendinopathies, and so they're just sort of strains within the muscles, and then the tendons, obviously, so a tendon is something that starts its life as a muscle, it turns into a tendon and it attaches to um, a bone. And each one will present slightly differently. So your neuromas, they'll get sharp, shooting, stabbing pain, a bit of numbness, um, plantar plate injuries, it may be walking a ball of foot, but we'll go through all these um, in, in, in a minute, really. So, neuromas, again, that wonderful um, image. Um, so, what are these neuromas? So, neuroma is effectively an enlargement, it's a benign enlargement of, of the nerve, of the nerve tissue. Um, so, basically, you're just getting some thickening of this nerve. And what will happen is, as you get thickening of the nerve, you then may see it then just then touches and then the, the metatarsal, your long toe bones, can then just compress against the nerve. And then that basically then gives you this shooting pain or sharp pain and people can say they get numbness in between the toes. Now, Morton's neuroma is the one that most people have heard of. When you stick neuroma into Google, Morton's is the one that will come up most commonly. <laughs> so, so just being really picky, Morton's neuroma is between your third and fourth. You can get neuromas between all of the other toes as well, but Morton's is the most common. But just think if you're getting those sort of symptoms and it's not between the third and fourth, but maybe say between the second and third, it can still be a neuroma. And people often describe it as the pain can be like a light switch is either there or it's not there. And you can, <clears throat> and the reason being is if there's nothing touching the nerve, then the pain then can go away. Now, how is it really aggravated? Um, for us in clinic, um, if everyone remembers from last week, and I'm really sorry, I forgot to record last week's, um, going off topic slightly here. Um, so what I will do, I will pre-record last week's, um, I'll just, and when I get some spare time, whenever that will be, um, I'll record it myself, then I'll load it to YouTube, and then I can give you guys the, um, the video. Um, but tight-fitting footwear will tend to aggravate your neurons. So if you're getting these sort of sharp pains, a bit of numbness between two toes, tingling, um, narrow fitting shoes or a sort of high heel type shoe will aggravate these, these symptoms. And people often say, when I go into something like a sandal or a trainer, symptoms get better. Obviously having a previous history of a neuroma or suffering from it before can, is, is a sort of a risk factor for having it. And then from your runner's aspect, for me in clinic, what we tend to see is if you're running, tend to running on, on the ball of the foot, so you're landing, bending up the toes, that again can increase um, the pain and symptoms that you can get with, with neuromas. Um, and there are some different lacing techniques you can use with your footwear advice. So if your footwear fits well, um, there are different ways you can lace your shoes so you can sort of miss the um, eye, eyelets out um, towards the front of the shoe. Um, so then when you put the shoe in, it just allows the foot to expand slightly. Um, orthoses, so orthoses is a technical word for an insole. And, and the main thing of that is something called a, 
a metatarsal dome. And if I was really prepared, I would actually, you know, I'm gonna go and grab one now quickly. Right, let me show you what a metatarsal dome is like. Should have one in this little pack. There we go. That's a little metatarsal dome, what they, what they look like. So, and then injections. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Very helpful for putting that link in um, to the um, plant to plate stuff. Injections can be really helpful. Um, steroids injections can be quite helpful. And then surgery, so you can either whip the nerve out completely or you can do sort of cry surgery. Some people are doing it in London now. Um, but obviously as I'm not a surgeon, so I just refer those people on. But I, I'm, I'm quite particular in that it's quite a, a stage process. So you get the footwear right, you try and insolve a metatarsal dome. If that doesn't work, then you try an injection. If that doesn't work, then you go for surgery. But if someone wants, if you want to go for surgery straight away, that is perfectly your choice and that is still a reasonable treatment option. <laughs> um, so footwear viewpoint is, I would really look at, say, getting the width right on the shoe. So if you're looking at trainers, companies like New Balance, Brooks, tend to come slightly wider. They will offer different width fittings. There's a brand of shoes called, called Ultra that have more of a square toe box rather than a tapered toe box. Um, Non-slip-on. So things like, oh, it's not going to be wearing flip-flops now because it's currently raining outside my office at home. And the things like wearing sort of thong-style flip-flops, so where you have to um, claw your toes, it, it, it won't be helpful. And then obviously something, oh, Kath, hello, happy birthday. I believe it's your birthday. Facebook told me it was your birthday. Um, and then something with a slightly stiffer sole as well. So I tend to find any shoes that are really flexible in the ball of the foot will encourage your toes to bend up, and that can sometimes put a bit more stress on, on that nerve. <clears throat> And then as we said last week, up to 72% of people wear shoes that don't fit correctly. And this was a nice study that came out a couple of years ago, I think now. Um, and then colleague of mine, Trevor Pryor from London, um, he surveyed his own patients. Um, and basically, he found that sort of nine out of 10 people wear shoes that were, that were too small. Metatarsal domes, um, for me, um, I'm quite particular. I think they have to be in the right place at the right time. And I, I do think it's a, something that you can apply um, yourself and you don't always have to have it on an insole. Sometimes you can just stick it to your shoe lining. Um, and to help people uh, with that, um, we basically created our own little box around Morton's aromas and about how to apply your own metatarsal dome. So you can go to um, our website, NK Active, and you can sort of buy in um, just these little packs um, that will show you how to stick a metatarsal dome, what I believe is the correct place, just behind the metatarsal head region. Um, and it's just using a template, put some tape in your foot, lipstick, stand on it, and there's a whole videos and metatarsal domes on, on what to do. And then if you've got any aroma, there's some advice sheets in there, or you can just buy the domes um, on their own. But if anyone wants any info for those, just let me know and we can do it. Afternoon, Glenn, how are we doing? Injections, um, as I say, they can be helpful. Um, and they can be helpful to help reduce the size of the nerve, help them be helpful to reduce the pain. Um, sometimes you can use um, what they call a local anaesthetic diagnostic injection to work out if you think the pain is neuroma related or not. Um, sometimes you can inject a bit of um, local just to work out and see if that takes the symptoms away. And then surgery, um, in my opinion, I think it is a really successful um, surgery. It's not that complex for surgeons to do. They can do it quite quickly and get some good results and leave minimal scarring. Um, but you, if they remove the nerve out, where that so if it's a Morton neuroma, you will be left with some numbness between the third and and the fourth toe. But it is something that can be really helpful. Um, but as surgery, there are risks. So there are risks that you can develop what we call a stump neuroma, 
So where they cut the nerve, you then get a bit of neuroma then develop on that bit of nerve um, that's been cut. And I've, I've seen that a couple of times, but it's not massively common. But anyway, when you then go see a local podiatric surgeon or orthopedic surgeon, um, they will explain all the risk attached um, to that. Plant plate injuries, personally, a bit of a favorite of mine. Again, sort of develops a bit of an interest in treating um, some of these. Um, so what is it? It's, there is some, sorry, there's been some sort of formatting issues um, on here. So basically it's a fibrocartilaginous structure, which in English basically means that it's a thick, toughened structure. So it's um, basically comes from your plantar fascia that starts back here and then metatarsal and then attaches your metatarsal to one of your toe bones and your phalanx, toe bones and your phalanx bones. Um, here um, i tried to find a, a decent picture that wasn't too gory and i couldn't quite find it and it's not exactly right on the image on the screen but you get the idea of where it's um where it's located um what do people describe it's all these ones where if you come in say so i've got a dull ache there's not often much swelling but you sort of come in so it's walking on on a pebble and you can start to then see some changes in the shape of the foot so you can get um, what we call floating toe, um, so where you're, you're standing up and the toe doesn't come in contact with the ground. Um, and then if you then got a plantar plate injury plus sort of the collateral ligaments, so there the ligaments attach to the side of the toe bones, um, you can get the Churchill V for victory um, sign, they, they call it. And most commonly with these is we see a few acute ones. So that's people down in the south coast, it's people jumping off because um, I literally live right near the sea, is people jumping off from their boats onto the jetty in their boat shoes, which are really, really flexible, and then they feel a pop and they swell, and that's an acute plantar plate um, rupture or tear. However, most commonly, it's a chronic overloading thing. Um, so it's something that just builds up over time and you're not really aware. And it is quite interesting that when you look at these, there was one study that they basically scanned a load of feet and they found, and all these feet had no pain, no symptoms. The feet were attached to people. Uh, and they almost found that near enough 50% of people that had plantar plate injuries didn't know they had one. Um, so if you ever see anyone with a sort of a hammer toe deformity or a floating toe, it may not be painful, but they have had a plantar plate injury, which has then led to that problem. So treatment, when you then go see your local podiatrist, healthcare professional, um, from a conservative viewpoint, is you're looking at footwear advice, you're looking at orthoses, taping, exercises, possibly injections. I don't refer many of these for um, in injections. And then if then that fails, then off to surgery. So orthoses wise, um, for me, what I think is the important part is you're using your metatarsal dome still on your orthoses or your insoles, sorry. Um, I try to keep this non-medical as I can. Um, and basically you can then, what we call in medical terms, a sulci extension with a cutout. So if you then look at that, um, that insole on, on the top left there, basically the aim is, is that you've got your metatarsal dome that sits just behind your metatarsal head there. And then you then have a cutout that sits just in front of the metatarsal um, joint. I'll come to the surgery for plantar plate injuries in a minute, Sarah. Um, Arnie, hello, long time no see. Um, and basically, you then have a cutout that sits just in front of the NTPJ, so that metatarsal phalangeal joint. So the reason for that is then what we want to try and encourage the toe to do is effectively drop down into that gap. So you then release the load and the tension underneath that um, plantar plate. And, and basically, if you have that cutout, I'm really sorry, I just pointed to my screen and obviously I'm pointing to the PowerPoint that I'm screen sharing and you can't see what I'm pointing at. Um, and basically, if you put it too far back, you can encourage the toe to do the opposite and bend up, which then increases the tension and the pain through the plantar fascia and then through the plantar plate. So from a footwear perspective, um, 
something like this. So these are the Hoka Carbon X. What's special about these shoes is that they effectively have a carbon lining. Again, I should have brought, I've got us there on my own shoes, so I should have just brought them in to show you. So effectively, when you go to bend the Hoka Carbon X, because you can't, and they've got a nice rocker like this insole has here. So as you go to push off, you don't need to bend your toes as much. So then you then just reduce the load going through there, which helps reduce um, the pain. And we've had some really good results using these carbon-based um, shoes. Personally, for your runners, I tend to stick to more to the Hoka than say the Nike 4%, because um, the Hoka have a slightly wider base. So I think people feel a little more stable on them rather than the, um, Nike's New Balance, if people like a wider fitting shoe, New Balance just released one called the TC Fuel Cell or Fuel Cell TC. I can't remember which way it is around. Um, however, the rocker is not as prominent on there compared to the Hoka. Um, and I plan to get try and get a hold of a set of the um, New Balance trainers as and when I can. But I haven't told my wife yet that I'm going to be buying more trainers. Um, so I really hope she's not watching at the moment. Um, I was, I'm going to get in trouble. Exercise ed taping can be really effective. So I sort of almost looks like the breast cancer ribbon sign. Um, so taping just to help try and prevent the toe from bending up again can be used in the short term to try and reduce symptoms. Now, the big thing that I'm really passionate about that I think can really help is exercises. Now, if this link works, it should take us to, um, YouTube channel. So here is, I've just developed a, um, just a quick sort of playlist of planter plates. So injuries and exercises. So a couple of the main ones are, um, just about just trying to, um, work on increasing the strength, um, within those planter flexors. Um, and I think it's, this is an important exercise to try and then build up the strength within the toes. And then you can then, then also then work on what I call toe push-ups or foot shortening exercises to work on building up the small muscles, the intrinsic muscles. So the definition of an intrinsic muscle in the foot is a muscle that starts its life in the foot and ends its life in the foot. And I think doing focusing on these is, is really, really important. Um, during for these planter plate problems. Um, yes, Tanya, I have hit the record button this time, don't worry. And Glenn, do you think the wider shoes also reduce the displacement of the Met heads from less squeeze? Um, yes. Um, so what um, Glenn is basically asking, so if you've got a proper fitting shoe and you're basically, you're not, if you've got a narrow fitting shoe and you're squeezing like this, you possibly then could be causing some mild displacement within the metatarsal head positions and the MTPJ. Um, so again, that's another reason why I think getting proper fitting shoes um, is always helpful. Bunions. Um, again, um, bunions are something that can cause issues with pain in, in the ball of the foot. And there is a cracking pair of bunions um, right there. Um, now, just to sort of bust a few myths regarding the bunion side of things, people often think of the bunion as this lump on the side of the toe. Now, this is where I've got to be careful because I know there are a, at least one surgical trainee watching, um, and I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm about to get this massively wrong. Um, but the definition of, of a bunion isn't that lump on the back. It's actually the angle between the metatarsal and, and the phalanx here, and I've just drawn the angle on here for you. Now, I can't remember what the number should, should exactly be um, on there to classify as a bunion, um, and that's your HAV angle, and then you then got something called your uh, intermetatarsal angle, so you can measure the, dip, the angle between your met first and your second metatarsal um, as well. And then it's from that, when you're looking at those, that then gives you your true definition of a bunion, not the lump on the side. So a lot of people think that when you, if you have bunion surgery, all you need to do is just shave off that bump on the side. It, it's a little more um, complex um, than that. Because if you just shave the bump off the sides, um, then that won't be classes. Yeah, Nikki, I think you're right. I think it is around that 16 degrees possibly slightly more i'm not sure 
I know Matt Mee's hopefully he's still watching. He may be able to let me know because he'll know exactly what it is. Um, then also, does anyone then spot the plantar plate injury? So this is again what your floating toe um, looks like. And remember early on when I was sort of saying that bunions may not be painful, but they can then help um, add to other issues. Um, and within this here, it is then obviously your big toe can't function as it needs to. Thank you, Matt. Um, and basically then your second toe then gets increased the load and your big toe is the only toe joint designed to take the load of sort of the body of three, four times body weight on walking. I think that's the top of my head. Um, whereas your second toe isn't. So then what you then find is then that's when they then develop the plantar plate injury. So actually seeing this appearance here is pretty common. Then as sort of healthcare professionals, um, we, we've got then to decide whether, um, okay, say if you've got a pain-free bunion, but then here you've got a painful second plantar plate injury. Okay, you fix the plantar plate or you help reduce the pain here, but then do you do anything with the bunion? And you can build an argument for treating it and not treating it. You can build an argument to say, yes, we'll treat it because that's what's caused the plantar um, plate um, injury. But you can build, also build an argument and say, well, the toe doesn't hurt, so why treat it? And like for me, it's a case by case basis. And that's when you have your discussions with your podiatrist, your physios, your, your podiatric surgeons and orthopedic surgeons to work out what is best for you at, at the given time, because th there is no exact right or wrong answer. So as we sort of said with bunion footwear advice, getting the width fitting is key, trying to make sure you haven't got any shoes that are rubbing the seams along the inside. So there, I think it is, is it Brace? I think they do some walking boots. They're basically their walking boots have a completely synthetic um, bit of material around the bunion area, around the big toe area. So that means you're going to get nothing, no seams rubbing on the toe itself. Um, things like the new trainers with sort of this fly knit and this knitted up as is, is nice and soft. So you're not going to get any rubbing on there. Insoles can be helpful. Now, the big thing with bunions is that you may see people saying, oh, we'll use a bunion splint. A bunion splint is not going to correct the deformity in a month of Sundays. You could wear it all day, every day, and you're not going to make any significant difference in the, phys in the um, visible appearance of, of that toe. And it's the same with when you use an insole or foot orthoses. You're not going to um, change or reduce the size of a bunion just by wearing an insole. All I would use an insole for in treating the bunion is if we can try and help take some of the pain away, but it's always remembering that we're not going to change the shape of the toe. And it's the same with the exercises. Yes, you can strengthen up the muscles around the toe to try and help take the pain away and walking and running, but you're not going to physically treat the problem um, itself. Um, so if you want to look the only really true treatment, if you want to resolve the bunion itself is to have it surgery. However, there are plenty of cases where the bunion is not causing any issues anymore. And then you decide, actually, I don't mind the shape of the toe. I'll just live with it because now I can do all the exercise, all the sports I want to do, and it's not causing any problems. So just because you've got one, does every bunion need surgery? No, it doesn't. However, it's something that could always be um, considered. And again, this is done by case by case basis, because when you look at surgery, um, you have to consider not just the surgery itself, but the impact on your life it has. Because unfortunately, a lot of people think, oh, if I have surgery, that's it will be done and dusted in six weeks. Um, that's not really the case. And I, I think you really, from start to finish, you're looking at six months plus by the time all the swelling and everything's fully settled. Um, so that's when you then need to have that discussions and work out what fits in your family life, work life, and take all those considerations. Because, okay, I don't treat, um, I don't, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't treat anything surgically. However, I see sometimes stuff when stuff hasn't gone to plan. And from what I see, a lot of time when things don't go to plan from a surgical viewpoint, is patients not fully listening to the post op advice. So they try to do something slightly sooner. Um, they should have. That's not all the time, but that is a thing that I, I do see. Um, so surgery can be helpful, but you just got to understand what it is you're having doing, and your surgeon will obviously explain that um, to you. Um, tendinopathy, as we've already 
describe the tendons are the things that attaches a muscle to a bone. And tendons will present themselves in a very particular way. And this is actually not just true for tendons in the ball of the foot, it's tendons everywhere. They will be stiff in the morning or after a period of rest. So from a lower limb perspective, say Achilles or something, if you've got an Achilles tendon problem, when you get out of bed, that's when it will be stiff. You'll hobble around for five, 10 minutes, and then the pain then may, may ease off or ask for a period of long, prolonged rest. So um, during this lockdown period, you may have got into a certain Netflix series or something, and then you've done the thing because Netflix also plays, you sit there and binge watch it, watch it, and then you're like, oh my God, a few hours have passed, and then you get up and then you hobble. And actually, when you then start walking or going for a run, it may hurt at the beginning, but then it may ease off. And the thing you'll notice is that if you have got a tendon problem and you've aggravated it, it will let you the following, know the following morning or even possibly the morning after that. So for example, if you've got a tendon issue in the, in the, in the foot, um, and I did have some nice anatomy drawings, however, I'm not allowed to use them, unfortunately. Um, so any tendon problems, the most common ones I see in, in, in the ball of foot is something called flexor digitorum longus. So in English, it's a muscle that starts in the back of the leg, comes round, and then you've got tendons attached to the toes. So if you overwork those, what will happen is you'll go for a run or go for a long walk, spend a long period of time on your feet. And then the morning after, you'll notice that aching, that pain, that stiffness is worse that following morning. They may not swell and most tendon problems aren't trauma um, related. And then what you can then try and do to then rehabilitate tendons is something what we uh, was designed and it's we sorry we didn't design we use in clinic and it was i think it was 2007 i can again pop the reference to the edgy rep and the key things when you're treating tendons is that we need to educate you so understand why it happened in the first place because the majority of these times it's what we call it's a loading problem so you've done too much too soon or you've had a sudden spike in activity level um and I did put a video, a quick, another webinar video, that how we can try and possibly reduce the risk of um, these spikes in activity levels. Because um, a, a few weeks ago, I did do a talk to some, some um, people in my networking group about, I do think that we could run the risk of people coming out of lockdown, their activity level spiking, so then injury levels then may spike as well. So with attending, we need to educate you on how it happened and how we can prevent, try and reduce the risk of happening again. You need to unload. Now, unload is a very particular word. It's unload, it's not rest. A lot of people use this term rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, you do not want to rest a tendon. Tendons like being used. If you rest a tendon long-term, you'll most probably make it worse rather than, than better because the tendon's ability to tolerate load and its muscle's ability to tolerate load will reduce over time. So you have to keep using it in an area it's happy to make sure it's still being worked to a degree. And then after that, we then need to then work on making everything stronger again. So the tendon can then do everything you need it to do. And then the key thing is to keep progressing forward to a point where it's strong enough and you can do all the activities that you want to do. So then what does that look like from a patient viewpoint in the ball of the foot? So say if you have got that that tendinopathy, the flexor drum longus underneath the foot there. And you may find actually it's come about because you have had a sudden increase in your running mileage, or you've changed your shoe to a more minimalist and flexible type shoe, and the tendon just haven't tolerated it and you've done it quickly. So what we may do is we may unload it. So we may will educate you about how it happened. Well, then unload it. And how would we unload it? Well, you may unload it by, again, using an insole of a metatarsal dome. You may unload it by using a stiffer soled shoe, for example. And then the reload, the reloading is when we then come on the exercises. So we start working on the, the exercise to make the, those tendons stronger, making the muscles in the ball of the foot. So doing those toe sort of push up exercises, as I call them. And then because it, and then you progress it. And because then it's, you'll want to say, go back to running, you need to get to the point where you can then go up and down on your toes. So you're doing up and down your toes, lots of hopping, lots of jumping. 
which previously irritated but now because we've unloaded it and we rebuilt the strength it can now tolerate you doing it and then the key thing with that is then you do what we call a maintenance program so you then keep on doing those three times a week just to maintain that new level of strength because tendons like to be used they like to be worked if you stop doing all the exercises what you may find the new strength gains you got then reduced and then you increase your risk of getting these problems so um let's bring me back in the room so hopefully that explains why i don't like the term metatarsalgia and why i think we really need to actually get get down to the diagnosis because as you could see there there were just a, a short snippet of all these different things that can cause pain in the ball of your foot and they're all treated in slightly different ways um, so any healthcare professional should be giving you a diagnosis when you go see them of what the problem is because if you get the diagnosis of metatarsalgia it doesn't tell you what you need to do to try and treat it so I sort of hope that was useful. If anyone has any questions, I think we'll just hang around for a couple of minutes and just pop them in, in the box. Ah, Sarah, surgery. Didn't you ask about surgery um, for plantar plate um, injuries? I think it's, so they, use a, they can use a bit of kit called um, the Viper, I believe it is. I think they, or Matt, you'll correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, and basically what they try and do is they basically grab one end of the plant that if you can find it or if not some, some of the tissues and then they basically just try and then bridge the gap and stitch it all, all back together. It's something that it's been done for a while but I think it's getting more popular because the equipment that they're using, they're using some pretty cool stuff to help basically as you do it, it then sort of self knits and then you can stitch it together and make it quite, um, quite strong um there we go viper or scorpion um how these companies come up with these names for these these um repair kits i i don't know but it's, it's one of those things that for me i think is and and, and matt and me all agree as well that it's I'd, i've seen some plans of plates and i've been and i sit in surgery on on a regular basis just to try and help and keep improving my knowledge and you see some plant plates that basically like they're, they're they've been chronically overloaded over time that, that there's no hope of repairing them at all so then sometimes you think well there's no tissues that there's no viable tissue because as soon as you try and suture it everything just falls apart um so what then sometimes they then have to do is either look at um, remove doing an osteotomy the removing part of the bone or they will then look at then maybe possibly fusing um, the toe, but there are many considerations on what surgery um, to do because it all depends on the viability of the tissue, the patient's age, activity levels. But this is where I sort of say to the, my patients, look, this is maybe I've done everything we can conservatively. Um, we haven't quite got achieved where we want to go to. Um, now I'll take over to the surgeons and they'll discuss everything you need to. Um, we are hopefully going to be publishing data shortly. So basically we sort of tried to develop a conservative um, treatment protocol that was really, I spoke about in the Tom Goon blog that uh, Stephen posted the link to earlier um, about how we can try and manage these without someone going down the surgery route because the majority of the literature at the moment is down the surgery route only. There are only two papers out there and they're both single case studies. Um, and for us, I have, for the last lot of plans of plate injuries, I think we've only sent three or four down for surgery. The others we've got, and we've got people back to dancing up like 20 hours a week. Um, what do we, and we've got people back to running on a, on a regular basis and with regards to then what i think is our success rate um for us I, I think so out of most probably so far when we looked at our data um we were taking a snap of it four months ago and we then wanted to leave it longer so we need to collect more numbers um but from that i would say what we've done is a about 80 to 90 percent of people return back to the activity we want them to do um, but i also think that we are um 
we are thinking that we, we, we try and select the patients that we think are going to do best um, with, with offloading them um, conservatively because based on the history we take and everything, we can say, look, actually in our hands, we think we're going to be better treating this. Or we may say from the word go, we send you down the surgery so we don't actually try the conservative measures. So for example, if we had someone young, fit and healthy, um, and basically they had an acute plantar plate rupture, I wouldn't dream of trying to manage that conservatively. I'd say, look, you're young, you're fit, you're well, off the surgeon straight away, because this is acute, this is fresh, they can try and then just repair this. Um, and Kyle's asking about the successful rate of strength over surgery. And this is, this is the issue. There is no data out there. Um, our data is, from what I use in clinic, is I know that when we do our treatments of these plantar plate problems, we will take strength testings using the handheld dynamometer at the beginning at the end. And we are seeing significantly large strength increases for people at the start of treatment um, compared to the end. So we know they're getting stronger. And so far, our data correlates um, that basically that then helps then get them back to activity and then they have a significant pain reduction. The thing we don't know, A, is that it will, it's a small data set. So at the moment, it's about 30, 40. Um, and we want it to be larger, um, ideally. And it's just us doing it in, in clinics. So there is still more work that needs to be, to be done, really. Um, Glenn, what is your option on differing met parabola and physician? Uh, I don't know what is your opinion, not option, I should imagine. Um, so um, what Glenn was asking is about metatarsal parabola so what we mean by metatarsal parabola is the length of your metatarsal so in theory what should happen is your second metatarsal is the longest followed by the first third fourth and fifth and you can get something called we call a long first so you get the first metatarsal longer than the second um, or your second metatarsal is short so it's shorter um, than the first and basically with that we know that um, that does increase the loading. So we do know that people who have a long second, what we see in clinic, will they're the ones that will tend to have the plantar plate injury. So every time we see a, a sort of a plantar plate injury in clinic that is linked to sort of chronic overloading, there is normally either a long first or a short second or a bunion um, in place the majority of the time. If there isn't, so if we look at our data, we know that if there is no other reason as to why there's a bit of a training error, why this happened, on average, it will take, with us, it will take us 12 um, to 16 weeks to get that person back to their activity they want to do, for example, running. However, if they've got even osteoarthritis in the foot or they've got a bunion, then they can take anything up to 42 weeks to achieve the results um, that we want conservatively. Um, what we then want to try and now do is then look at basically can it, if, if you have a bunion over midfoot arthritis how much does that affect because there are many things that can affect the forefoot and it's, it's a complex piece that takes um uh, a, a lot of loading and it's something that i think from a conservative viewpoint plant to plate injuries we don't understand enough yet and we're hoping we can then start adding to that database and start a database of of research and proposing certain methods on how we may treat these. Now we may be right, we may be wrong. Um, I'm prepared to start trying to put some stuff out there, and then a year's time, if I'm proved that I'm wrong and I need to change it, then I'll change it. And and so, be it. everyone sort of knows that like the way I, we like to operate is that we're not scared of failure, as it were will happily do stuff and we'll just be guided by what our clinical data and what the evidence um so i what the evidence currently shows us um and that's why we need more evidence from a conservative viewpoint because as a non-surgical person that's how i manage things is is without um without my basically carpentry kit um matt i would say suspect high correlation yeah no i i would I would definitely agree um, with that one. Anyone else got any comments? Apologies for the non-medical folk um, watching. Um, it sort of just has a few questions by colleagues that sort of left me down that, that tangent, but it's, it's, all, it's all good stuff. Um, right, if anyone else hasn't got anything um, they want, um, 
Yeah, good, good. Glenn, perfect. We're all singing the same hymn sheet. It makes my life a lot easier when my colleagues agree with me. Um, so if anyone else hasn't got any other questions, um, if you think of any that you want, just drop me an email or post in the comments here. It's not a problem. I will happily answer um, anything you want me to, even if it's not forefoot related. So any non-patients out there, if you've got any injuries, niggles, the one that's not related to um, problems in the body of foot, just let me know. If anyone wants the next week's topic, if anyone wants anything in particular, just ping me a message and I can design a little PowerPoint like I did and we'll just carry on doing the way we have been doing. But um, I'm going to dash now. Everyone have a lovely Friday. It is currently stopped raining here. Um, now stay safe and I will catch you all next week and I shall see you all later. Um, uh, bye bye.